2 Corinthians chapter 3. Let me read for us just these first six verses. Paul writes, Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, as some do, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are a letter of recommendation written on our hearts to be known and be read by all. And you show that you're a letter from Christ delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God. Not that we're sufficient in ourselves to claim anything is coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant. Not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Most of you know the basic division of the New Testament. You know the pastoral epistles, our first and second Timothy and Titus. Sometimes Philemon gets thrown in there. But, you know, more than Philemon, the other pastoral epistle really is 2 Corinthians. At least the first half of 2 Corinthians, it is about pastoral ministry. And it's, a, it's not normally classified as a pastoral epistle because it's written to the church, not to the pastor of the church like Timothy and, and Titus were. Nevertheless, in a sense, it's Paul writing to explain his pastoral ministry. At least the first half of this book is his defense of pastoral ministry. And what's behind all of it is the unique nature of being a pastor. I don't like much talking about pastoral ministry from the pulpit because it feels like I'm talking about myself and that's not my my goal my goal tonight is to help you better understand 2 Corinthians 3 but to understand that you really do need to understand the church a little bit from a pastoral perspective the pastoral ministry more than any other profession in the world demands spiritual qualifications you know there's no secular job and I, I don't believe in a secular sacred distinction like one it's more pleasing to god to be a pastor than it is to be a plumber of course not the protestant reformation was in large part over that uh, is god working through the world significantly differently through his through the pastoral paid staff of a church than he's to the lay people no he's not but you can go too far in that and say that there's no differences between the two there are very much differences between working in vocational pastoral ministry and working in the secular world you know if you apply for a secular job there might be some character qualifications but there's not spiritual qualifications because god's kingdom and glory are at stake in the souls of individuals the new testament lays out the qualifications for what it takes to be a pastor the pastor is not just a knowledge thing the pastor has to be knowledgeable of spiritual things he's got to know the book in the same way that a lawyer knows knows law code or the doctor knows uh new medical protocols and all that it tested and examined i mean when you go to your doctor you don't want them to say ah, oh, you know i remember hearing about this a long time ago let me let me call a friend that's not the answer you're looking for with the pastor, they're supposed to be experts in the book, but it's not just an intellectual expertise. Pastors are supposed to be spiritually fit, fortunately not physically fit, but spiritually fit. But it's not just spiritually fit, it goes beyond fitness and it gets to actual spiritual capacity in a pastor's life. A pastor is supposed to be, the New Testament lists these twice, by the way, First Timothy 3 and Titus 1, hospitable, self-controlled generous with money respected by those inside the church respected by those outside the church have a family that is in order to the point where they're examples to be gentle with people both critics and friends and as if that were not enough his life has to be above reproach paul tells timothy the pastor needs to leave his life in such a way that nobody can reasonably bring an accusation against him it's not just that the pastor is innocent of accusations, it's that he's above reproach. That if somebody were to say, oh, did you hear so-and-so did this or that, that above reproach means that you wouldn't believe that. I mean, he leads his life in such a way that you just wouldn't buy it. It just doesn't sound reasonable. He has to be a skilled teacher. And that doesn't mean just eloquently. It has to be how he brings the truth of Scripture to bear on life. And finally, he has to be thoroughly equipped to handle the Word of God. It's not merely knowing the minor prophets and the kings of Israel. It's talking about knowing the content of this book and bringing it to bear in any situation in the world. That's on the positive side. On the negative side, the disapp disappointments in ministry can be staggering. You lose friends. You pour your time and energy into someone for months or even years with 6 a.m. discipleship meetings at Starbucks or in our case here, Bob Evans. 
discipleship and accountability over and over and over again, only to see years seem to go down the drain when the person walks away from the faith. Beyond the basic practical arguments against the life of being a pastor, there's spiritual objections. Pastors go into the world of millstones. Jesus says, if you cause a weaker believer to stumble, better for you to have a millstone tied around your neck and be cast into the sea. James says that pastors will be judged twice as strictly. In that book that I always give out uh, by Clint Archer, The Preacher's Payday, in a large section it applies to every believer, but it uh, applies to pastors in a unique way in that we're judged twice as strictly. Meaning that when you're teaching, you have basically more opportunities to cause people to sin. <laughs> you're in a position of a spiritual authority, and if you lead naive and innocent children in the faith away, the Lord himself will take his vengeance, the scripture says. And that's what it means when Paul says in Hebrews, that Hebrews 13, that pastors will be judged for how they shepherd their people, even if their people aren't joyful. <laughs> so just meditate on that for a second. What Paul says is even if the people don't like their pastor, the pastor's still going to be judged for how he shepherded them. (laughs) Doesn't get you off the hook. You can't say, ahead, they fired me. It's a phenomenal sermon to read Jonathan Edwards' farewell sermon to his church. They fired him, and yet they allowed him to preach one last time. And he didn't go to his pulpit and preach like a nice conciliatory message of like, you know, we'll all see each other in heaven and sing Kumbaya then, and until then I'm going to be a missionary with the Indians and and have a good life. No, he gets up behind the pulpit and says, we're going to see each other in heaven again, and the Lord is going to hear our case and judge us, and one of us is right and the other of us is wrong. And believe me, I know the Lord better than you, and I'm in the right. (laughs) See you later. I mean, it's a staggering message to read. In light of the dangers of being a pastor, in light of the high spiritual qualifications, why would anybody do it? Well, if you study church history, you look at, especially in the 16 and 1700s, people, some people did it because they thought it was a life of ease, and it was back then. And, I mean, they, they got fed by everybody, and they didn't have to work a real job. <laughs> I've had people ask, you know, what, you know, you have church on Sunday, what, what do you do the rest of the week? I love that question. I love it. You, know, you ask an Olympic sprinter, what do you do the other, you know, outside of the 9.6 seconds that you run, what do you do the rest of your life? <laughs> Being a pastor is a spiritual ministry. That's why people do it. It's a spiritual ministry. What does that mean when you say it's a spiritual ministry? That's kind of the question that 1 Corinthians 3 is dealing, or 2 Corinthians 3 is dealing with. And that's why, by the way, I said this is the chapter that probably gives you the clearest window into the, how the Holy Spirit is at work in his church and in your lives today. It's right here because it's the answer to that question. When I say, why would a person do the job of a pastor? Why? The answer is because it's a spiritual ministry. What does that mean? It's a spiritual ministry. Does it simply mean that, oh, they're teaching the word of God to the people of God, and so that has kind of a spiritual sound to it, and, you know, people will talk differently uh, to you because they know you're a pastor. They might swear less around you because it's a lot spiritual to swear around you, and so, oh, you're a spiritual person, so I won't cuss when I'm around you. Is that what it means that it's a spiritual ministry, or that, you know, they gathered in church on Sundays, and you're talking about the Bible, and so that's a, a spiritual thing. We have spiritual conversations because it's about religion and faith and that's what it means that it's a spiritual ministry? Is that what we're talking about? And the answer to that is is no, because every person in the church is part of that. So what does it mean that it's a spiritual ministry that pastors have? It means that the Holy Spirit is not just involved with the pastor's ministry, but inside of the pastor's ministry. The Holy Spirit indwells the pastor And as he teaches the word of God to the people of the church, the Holy Spirit is also indwelling each of the members of the congregation. The Holy Spirit indwells believers at their salvation, but causes them to grow through the teaching of the word. The teaching of the word, to use Paul's example earlier, is the watering of the the spiritual fruit. Now the spiritual plant that's planted there, that's the believer. And the believer is the seed of the gospel is planted in your heart. Now the watering of the word is causing what's in the heart to grow. And that's the teaching of the Bible. It's astonishing that the Lord uses preaching as his means of grace to the church. You know, there's nothing else like this going on anywhere in the world. I'll guarantee that. (laughs) And here you all are on a Sunday evening. March Madness is going on. And yet you're here. There might not be any games tonight. I have no idea, but you're here. 
Some of you are looking at your phones. No, there's games going on. <laughs> Refresh. <laughs> You're here to listen to the songs that we sing and, and you sing, but it's pointing to the word where I'm going to stand up and talk for roughly 34 more minutes if you're keeping track <laughs> about the Bible that was written thousands of years ago. It's so strange, but this is what God has designed to feed the church. It's the word of God that feeds your soul every day, but the church corporately, you're fed through the teaching of the word. And that's the Holy Spirit who, who's inspired the word, the Holy Spirit who seals the pastor, enlightens him to the study of the word. And then as he's speaking, the spirit is using that into your hearts. You have spiritual ears. You hear the word being taught. It's going into your spiritual soul and the spiritual plant of your life is growing because of it. That's what it means when the scripture describes being a pastor as a, pa as a spiritual ministry. And that's what 2 Corinthians 3 is about. I'm going to give you three proofs tonight just in verses 1 through 6. Three proofs of the spiritual nature of ministry. Three proofs of the spiritual nature of the ministry. But before we get into that, I just need a brief tangent. When I say the Holy Spirit is involved in the church or the pastoral ministry is spiritual in nature, you have to understand who the Holy Spirit is. And we all know the Holy Spirit is God. We've got that, right? Jesus is God, the Son, and, and the Father is God, the Father, and the Spirit is God, the Spirit. And so the, all three persons are God. That's the Trinity. We've got it. St. Patrick's Day was just a few moments ago. That's the uh, sin of partialism is the idea that, you know, each part of the clover is one-third of God. That's not true. Each part of the Trinity is not one-third of God. Each part of the Trinity is, is holy God, of course. But the clover still makes a good illustration. We know it flirts with heresy, but it's still a good illustration at some point. That the three different parts of the clover represent the three persons of God, and together they, they make God. You know, it's not quite that easy, but we understand the Holy Spirit is God. But you have to go a little bit beyond that. You have to go to exactly what it means that God is one being in three persons. One nature, one nature, each member of the Trinity with his own nature, but three persons making up God and I, I talked on this a couple months ago in First John, chapter one, verse fourteen. Uh, it was the text about how the, the word is spoken, how the the Father speaks the Son. The, the doctrine is called eternal generation of the Son. It's the image is that of the Father always with His word. There's never been a time where the Father has not had a word with Him. The Father has always spoken. There's not a time where the Father was quiet and then began to speak. No, the Father has always projected. He's always communicated. And the content of the Father is what He communicates. And that content is the Son. He's generated from the Father, but without beginning. He's eternally generated. And the example that Jonathan Edwards gives, which I really do think is helpful, is imagine if you had a view of yourself, if you were to look at yourself and how you have your own self-image. Well, for God, that self-image is, is perfect. Your self-image is flawed. You think of yourself more highly than you should or differently than, than you really are. There's always a variation between your own perception and the reality. It's not true with the Father. The Father's image of himself is exactly true. And he's always had it. And he, it's not just that he's always had it. He always communicates it. It's always spoken. That's the word. That's the, the logos, the word of God. That the Son always is with the Father. The Father's always been a Father. He's eternally the Father. There's never a time when he didn't have a Son or he wouldn't eternally be a Father. So the Father and the Son are eternal in that sense. The Son being generated by the Father but without beginning. Now this, in turn, leads to the spirit. The spirit, the, the fancy theological word is uh, spiration, or the, the spirit, that's why we call him the Holy Spirit, that it's, he's spirited from the Father and the Son. The Father and the Son have an affection towards one another. They have a relationship with one another. There's, there's a love between the two. There's interaction between the two, and that interaction is a, an external being, but not external to the Godhead. That interaction is the Holy Spirit the third member of the Trinity. In the same way the Father generates the Son from all eternity past, the Father and the Son together spirit the Spirit. It's, he speaks of the love that they have, but not love just in terms of like a human affection, like, I love you or I'm angry at this or happy at this. With God, you're not in that world. He's, the affection, the interaction between the Father and the Son, it's, it's, it's a person. And that person is the Holy Spirit, all three with all the glory and dignity and majesty of God, all three equally God, each one individually God. 
which connects back to their, their generation, the son always being spoken, the word always being spoken, but individually he's God because he's the perfect word. Holy Spirit always being spirited, the constant love and joy and harmony in the Trinity. That's why when people think of before God created the world, they wonder, was God bored? They God wasn't bored. He has this perfect love within the Trinity. The Father's perfect love and joy in his Son. The, the Spirit's perfect delight and contentment of the Trinitarian relationship between the Father and the Son. The Son's perfect joy in representing the Father and being the complete image of him. What's the nature of the Trinity? Now, when you say that the pastor's work is spiritual, what you're really saying is that what the church is doing is spiritual. And what you're really saying is that the spirited being of God, the eternal spirit of God, is at work, not just in the church, but he's at work in you. The same generative power that produces the Son, although without beginning, he's, he's always existed, but that same power from God, reflecting the being of God, that's at work in you as a finite human being, as the Holy Spirit resides in you, causing you to believe the gospel and grow from the word of God. That's what I mean when I say that the church is spiritual. The Holy Spirit himself is at work in us. Jesus says it this way, John 15, 26, when the helper comes, I'm gonna send you from the Father. Notice that interaction there. Jesus says, I'm gonna send the Spirit, but the Spirit's from the Father. How is the Spirit from both the Father and the Son? That's the clearest verse, John 15, 26, that describes the Holy Spirit as coming from both of them. Jesus is sending him, but he's coming from the Father. That's the Trinity right there. And Jesus says the spirit of truth will proceed from the Father. That's where the word procession comes from. The spirit of truth will proceed from the Father and he'll testify about me. Matthew 10, 20. It's not you who speak, but it's the spirit of your Father who speaks in you, Jesus says to believers. Don't worry about what you'll say when you're put on trial or you're persecuted because it will be the Holy Spirit from the Father who's teaching you what to say. John 16, 7. Jesus says, I tell you the truth. It's to your advantage that I go away because when I go away, the, the helper will come to you. If I don't go, the helper won't come. But when I go, Jesus says, I will send the helper to you. In Romans 8, 9. The spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone doesn't have the spirit of Christ, he doesn't belong to him. The spirit of God, referred to as the spirit of Christ, dwells in believers. 1 Peter 1, 11. We have the spirit of Christ. Any person with the spirit of Christ within them has predicted the sufferings of the Christ. As prophets had the, the spirit of Christ that was revealing truth to them. It's, the Holy Spirit is constantly referred to as the spirit of God, the spirit of the Father, the spirit of the Son, and he dwells in the church. He comes to us. His salvation doesn't just come to us. He makes us alive. He gives us his regeneration. Jesus says you have to be born of the spirit by washing of the water and the spirit. Water being the word transforming you, the spirit using the word to change lives and then making you a new creation, bringing you to spiritual life. So how can I prove that that's happening in the church? Well, there's three ways just in these first six verses and we'll look at more of it the next few weeks. First, there's qualified pastors in the church and there's qualified pastors what a staggering contrast the New Testament qualifications for a pastor and elder are from the Old Testament qualifications. <laughs> you know, we were talking earlier before the service. Can you think of anybody in the Old Testament who is elder qualified by New Testament standards? <laughs> I mean, anyone? And we came up with a list of like six or seven of them, but that's not enough for a church planning movement to go global, believe me. <laughs> It's just different. The basic qualifications for what it means to be an elder in the New Testament were practically unheard of in the Old Testament. It's not because they didn't have sufficient revelation to know to be hospitable or self-controlled or to avoid drunkenness. I mean, there's enough revelation in the Old Testament that you would think they should know how to act, but there wasn't the indwelling work of the Spirit in the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit made people spiritually alive, but didn't indwell them and sanctify them like they do in the New Testament to say nothing of his work within pastors. You think a priest in the Old Testament priests were glorified butchers i mean there's not even a hint of spiritual qualifications in the old testament when it comes to priests priests in the old testament they were could be defiled and and disregarded from ministry but it was external defilement this is why it was such a a, a, a crime when david touched the showbread <laughs> i mean they tried to kill him for it it was this entire, and Jesus makes a point in Matthew 12, by the way, and Mark 3, that that was entirely external. 
But David wasn't defiled on the inside. Come on now. Not by that. And so that's the world Paul is stepping into here. Paul had been planted this Corinthian church. He was their pastor. He grew them. He watered them. He watched them grow. And this was his church. Other than the Philippians, the Corinthians are probably his favorite church. The Ephesian church being the most spiritually mature church in the New Testament. But the Corinthian church seems to be so close to Paul's heart. He'd spent so much time there. He knew them. This, these were his people. But when he left, they turned against him. They started to embrace false teaching and, and bad doctrine. And people came along trying to lead them astray from the truth. And these people that came along, I mean, they didn't know them. But these people came along with these letters of, of commendation, letters that said, we're sent from this church or we're sent from this apostle or John the, the Baptist disciples approved of us. And most of them were probably fake. And even if they were real, what they're teaching was not in accordance with what Paul had taught them. And so people are pushing back in the church and saying, hey, you're leading us astray. And they would say, we have these letters. Look, so-and-so in Jerusalem signed off on us. The deacons ratified it and everything. I don't know the actual conversation, but I bet it went something like that. And so then they turn around and say, well, well Paul, where are you? where's your letter of recommendation? I mean, they're just grasping. Like, it's the, it's the kind of that, that bad leadership. Instead of opposing the false teachers for what they're saying, you think in categories like, well, they have letters. If only Paul could provide a letter, and then we can deal with them on equal terms. Paul, do you have your letter of recommendation? Now, what, a, what a joke to ask Paul for his letter of recommendation. The person who planted the church and grew the church, you're going to ask him for a letter of recommendation? He planted the church. He led you all to Christ. And you want his letter of recommendation? But that's what they're asking for. And so what would you do if you were Paul? I mean, go back to Jerusalem and ask James to sign a guy? No, James, I know you sent me before. And James did send Paul with a letter before. It's not that he didn't have it. Paul had a letter of recommendation from James. But he's not going to give it to the Corinthians. How insulting. How insulting. I mean, the nerve. But they ask for it. So now Paul's in the awkward situation. How do I explain myself? Do I have to talk about how good I am? I mean, that's weird. Uh, it's been a while since I've candidated for a pastoral position, but I remember the weirdness of those questions. Would you describe your strengths? Oh, yes, I would love to talk about me and how good I am at things. Hmm, how many words? Because I can go all day at this. I have lots to say about me being good. And they're like, oh, wait, it's a pastor position. There's supposed to be humility in the church. So, okay, no strengths to note. No, that doesn't sound right either. <laughs> what do you do? You know, I, anyway, that's where Paul's stuck in. So he says in verse one, are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Do I have to start telling you how good I am? I mean, that's because at the end of chapter two, he talks about how much persecution he's gone through and how he's the aroma for life to those who are being saved. He's saying, people are coming to faith when they're being around me because they see the gospel in me, but you want a letter? Or we, do we need, he says in chapter three, verse one in the middle, as some do, letters of recommendation to you or from you. Paul says, I can't figure out which one you're asking for. Yeah, I mean, because if I were to get one, I would get it from you. Do you want to type it and put it in your own file? Is that what you want? Because you're my church. Hey, elders of Corinth, I need a letter of recommendation to the elders of Corinth about how I planted you and led you to faith in Christ and grew you. Could you write that for me? Paul doesn't know where to begin. And he says this, you yourselves are a letter of recommendation written on our hearts to be known and read by all. Paul says, it doesn't matter if I don't have my paperwork in order. I have a church that I've grown. You are the letter of recommendation, Paul says. Now think about what he's saying by that. They want proof that Paul is from God. They want proof that Paul is a New Testament elder, that he is a New Testament pastor, that he's preaching the actual gospel. There was no Facebook back then, so they couldn't log in and check, you know, who are the friends of these other apostles? Oh, they're all friends with heretics, so let's not listen to them. That didn't exist. Those other apostles had these letters, and so they want to know where Paul's letter is. And, and Paul says, just listen to yourself for a second. You came to faith supernaturally. Salvation is not natural. It's the Holy Spirit bringing you to life. You came to faith supernaturally through my ministry. What is the hallmark qualification of a pastor? It is effectiveness in ministry, not effectiveness in drawing a crowd, not effectiveness in eloquence, not effectiveness in ministry style, but effectiveness in seeing people come to Christ and grow as Christians. That's what it means to be effective. And that's all supernatural. 
So how are they growing supernaturally through Paul's ministry if Paul is not qualified? That's his logic here. He's been set aside. His life meets the qualifications. And they happen to be growing. Their spiritual qualifications. That doesn't just happen. Now, that's not to say that, you know, a big church automatically has qualified elders. I used to believe that. I used to be on staff at a church that had appalling leadership in the, in the ministry. and Just appalling. But the parking lot was packed every Sunday. And so I remember one particular morning looking at one of my friends and saying, oh, things are not right in the leadership of this church. But look how many people are here. It's got to be okay. I believe that. But that doesn't contradict this. What was going on there was it was shallow. There was not actual spiritual transformation. There wasn't spiritual depth happening there. It was was a full parking lot, but there was no spiritual substance to what was going on there. That's not true in Corinth. There was some spiritual depth. depth. Now, it was a church with all kinds of issues, but it was a church that people that had been transformed. And that's why Paul can say, I am as good of a pastor as you are of a listener. I'm as good of an elder as you are as a Christian because he was the one who grew them. You want my letter of recommendation? It is you, he's saying. Look at what the Holy Spirit has done to you. What more do you want? In the book of Ezra, there's a really interesting anecdote there where the Israelites return from exile and they're resetting up the temple again and temple worship and Ezra wants the people's paperwork. The Levites are there to do the temple ministry and Ezra says, where's your, where's your paperwork? And many of the Levites had lost their paperwork in exile. They'd been in, ex- in Babylon for seven decades. They didn't have their paperwork in order. What are they supposed to do? And Ezra has just an ingenious solution. Okay, we'll still call you Levites, but don't come to the temple. Notice it had nothing to do with spiritual qualifications, just their paperwork wasn't in order. Don't come to the temple. No paper, no priestly function. Because under the old covenant, that's what mattered. There was a simple rule, only Levites could be priests. Not true under the new covenant. Under the new covenant, anybody, well, we're all priests, but under the new covenant, anybody who's spiritually qualified meets the qualifications of 1 Timothy 3 can be a pastor because they're spiritual qualifications. You know, I've often thought a better approach on pastoral search committees, rather than asking for a letter of recommendation, would be talking to the people under the, I'm not planning on going anywhere, by the way. (laughs) But I've often thought, if you're a church and you're looking for a pastor, don't ask for letters of recommendation. It's just so weird. Instead, talk to people who've been under the person's ministry. Ask them, how's the Lord changed you in the last 10 years? How have you grown spiritually? I mean, you will get a way better window into the qualifications of a pastor by that question than asking him to come up with four people to write a letter about how, you know, three paragraphs long of the template they got off of word.com. I have a low view of those kind of letters, by the way. <laughs> anyway, the first evidence of the Holy Spirit working in the church is that there's qualified pastors. They don't grow in trees. They come from the work of the Holy Spirit. Secondly, change lives. Change lives. Paul says that you are the letter. They're written on our hearts. I mean, Paul's heart was broken by them. This is the same language she used uh, earlier. He's going to use it again in 2 Corinthians 7. He says, my heart stands open. He invited the Corinthians into his heart. They walked all over his heart. They broke everything. They broke all the furniture in his heart, and they stormed back out. And Paul's response to that was, my heart is standing open to you. I will always love you. You you may have blasphemed against me. You may have slandered me. You may have given false accusations against me, but my heart will always love you. Come back anytime, he tells them. That's a, what a contrast to so many pastors who get, you know, wronged by a church and they say, oh, I've learned my lesson. I had people in, in my house, so I'm not going to have people in my house anymore. I had friends in my last church. I won't make friends in my new church. I learned my lesson. How different Paul is. You've wronged me and wronged me and wronged me. Now you want a letter from me? But you are my letter and you are always in my heart. Notice he says the letter's written on our hearts. He's speaking of himself here, first person plural, first person plural, because he's grasping for ways to demonstrate humility here. But he's saying, you're written on my heart. You would expect him to say the other way. You know, uh, the letter recommendation is written on your heart. You know the truth, but he's talking about himself. It's on my heart. He says, I know that I meet the qualifications. I know I'm legitimate because I see your lives. It's ingrained in my heart. They can fire Paul, they can throw him out, but they cannot get themselves out of his heart. You can kick Paul out of Corinth, but you can't take the Corinthians out of his heart. He says it can be known and read by all. In other words, even the people in Corinth see the transformed lives of the Corinthians and they know their pastor is legit. The whole world can see. 
We're seeing it right now through the pages of Scripture. And you show, he says in verse 3, that your letter from Christ, delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God. They are a letter, not the kind that's written on paper. Not with ink. Because listen, this is the difference with ink. Ink doesn't go inside you. You know, I might tell my kids, don't write on yourself because you could get some kind of lead poisoning or something. It'll, you know, your body will osmosis and, or something. I don't know. It's not true. <laughs> Just hard to scrub off. What well, doesn't get to your heart? You know, the Old Testament, that's what the law in many regards was like. It was just words on paper. And he's, he doesn't want to speak too derogatively of it because it's inspired by God, and we'll talk more about that in a second. But the bottom line was the Old Testament couldn't get inside of you. I mean, Moses comes down with the Ten Commandments written on rock, and he gets so angry with the Israelites, he breaks them. <laughs> what an awesome scene that is. Fine. <laughs> you don't even get the law. And God says, no, you're going to carve that again. <laughs> That's the Old Testament. That's not... The New Testament. This is not how the Holy Spirit is at work in the church today. You don't see, you don't have your life changed by conformity to an, you know, an external standard. You have your life changed in the church because the Holy Spirit is inside of you, conforming you one degree of glory to another. The last part of verse three explains this. Not tablets of stone, speaking of the Ten Commandments, but tablets of human hearts. As a believer, God is at work in your heart. In your heart. The old covenant was literally a set of laws, literally written on stone. The new covenant is no such thing. It's written on hearts. The old covenant was supernaturally delivered by angels and everything, but it was naturally inscribed by Moses' hand. The new covenant is supernaturally inscribed on human hearts. This was prophesied in the Old Testament, of course, Jeremiah 31, 33. This is the covenant I'll make with the house of Israel. After those days, declares Yahweh, I'll put my law inside of them. I'm going to write it on their hearts, he says. And so now Paul is telling the Corinthians, the law is on your heart. How did it get there? Did Paul cut them open and write it on their heart? Of course not. So now you have to back up. And I don't want you to, in Paul's sarcasm here, I don't want you to let Paul's sarcasm obscure just the incredible Trinitarian truth of what's happening here. He says, you, church, it would be like me talking to you, Emmanuel Bible Church. I would say, you, church, are my letter of recommendation. And you might say, how? And I would say, it's written on my heart. It's written on my heart. Not in your heart right now. I'm on my heart. It's written on my heart. What's written there? Your changed life. And your changed life is seen written in your heart. So how did it get under your heart? The Holy Spirit sent from God the Father and God the Son, the Trinitarian majesty here, the spirit, the love and affection in the Trinity is sent to reside in you. Notice what it says. It's a letter written by Christ. Christ wrote this with his own hand. Jesus is the author of what is on your heart. What ink did Jesus use? The Holy Spirit. He is the one that is inside of you. Jesus doesn't live in you in that sense. It's the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the author of what's inside of you. But it's the Holy Spirit who wrote it there. The new covenant is not on tablets of stone. The new covenant is not obtained by external standards. It changes your life by what's inside of you. When you lived under the law, your identity was based on external standards, on your performance. Thus, the Old Covenant was a ministry of condemnation. The Old Covenant could not save you. It was the old example of the mirror versus the toothbrush. The mirror will show you you need your brush to your teeth, but it is not going to brush your teeth for you and don't try. It wasn't given to you for that. It was given to you to show you that you need help. So you look in the mirror in the morning, yikes, <laughs> this will take longer than yesterday. That's what the mirror is for. But the mirror doesn't, don't comb your hair with it, don't shave with the mirror. It's not given for that. That's the difference in the old covenants, in the new covenant. The old covenant was not designed to change you. It was designed to break you. It was designed to condemn you. That's how God meant it. Now, it was spiritual. It was written by the Holy Spirit and delivered to the world. So it's wrong to say the old covenant wasn't spiritual, the new covenant is. No, the old covenant was spiritual and that the Holy Spirit inspired it. But it was not spiritual in the sense that it was not inside of you. 
That's why Paul says down here, it's the ministry of death later on in verse six. The old covenant was the ministry of death. God's standard is perfect obedience and whoever broke one part of the law is guilty of breaking all of it. So in Israel, everybody has sinned. How are they supposed to be saved then when they, the law can't save them? Listen, if you broke one part of the old covenant and the old covenant was po- impossible to keep perfectly, if you broke one part of it, you were condemned by it forever and all time. It's hopeless. Now, whose fault is that? Is it the fault of the law? No. So don't get mad at the mirror for telling you that you need more time to get ready. (laughs) It's not the mirror's fault. It's not, and the reason I stress this is because it's so easy to think the old covenant had a shortcoming. The old, it's not the fault of the old covenant. The old covenant wasn't designed to get into your heart and fix you. It wasn't. That's only the Spirit who can do that. Only the Spirit. This doesn't mean the Old Covenant was devoid of God's blessing. Rather, it means the Old Covenant was filled with glory because it came from God, but that glory didn't change your life. It only condemned your life. And so the point here is that the New Covenant is filled with people with changed lives. Where did that come from? It comes from the working of the Holy Spirit. That's why it's a spiritual ministry, being a pastor, to see lives changed according to the work of the Spirit. Thirdly, the Holy Spirit has confident ministers. Confident ministers. And here, Paul's not speaking necessarily of pastors. Here he's using the, the, the Greek word diakonos, deacon. Of course, he's gonna name a female deacon later, later on. And he's talking about people in the church, people who are serving Christ now. So we've changed a little bit. Now he's talking about confident. The word translated here in the ESV is minister. But the word is diakonos. Such is the confidence, he says in verse four. This is the way I'm getting the word confidence. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ towards God. And now this is no longer the royal. We, now he's speaking of the church. We all have this confidence through Christ towards God. You have confidence to approach God. And again, pause and marvel at the contrast. Moses didn't want to go on the mountain. He had to be shooed up the mountain. Isaiah said, woe is me, I am undone. But we have boldness to approach Christ, confidence to come to him. We have confidence through Christ towards God. We don't have confidence to walk to God on our own. We have confidence to walk to God through Christ. He is the door. This is a full Trinitarian concept here. You have confidence to approach God through Christ and that only comes through the indwelling work of the spirit. That's where you get your confidence from. And again, Paul's saying this could not possibly be a human endeavor. Verse five, not that we're sufficient in ourselves to claim anything is coming from us. Paul says, I don't have the grounds to say that anything good is in me at all. Even in my pastoral qualifications, there is nothing good in me. We're not sufficient in ourselves to claim anything is coming from us. Our sufficiency is from God. The full trinity, the father designs it, the son implements it, but specifically the spirit who is giving you confidence at this very moment. If you have confidence to pray to God, if you have confidence to appeal to God, that is the proof of the Holy Spirit working in your heart. Confidence is from God, verse six, who has made us sufficient to be ministers, the oculus of the new covenant. Not of the letter, but of the spirit. We serve the church not by holding people accountable to an external standard. We serve the church by preaching the spirit-filled gospel. The spirit-filled gospel. You know, the charismatics have stolen the phrase spirit-filled. I'll ask, are you spirit-filled? The answer is always yes. Are you spirit-filled? Yes. If you go up Braddock Road, you see Braddock Road Baptist Church and the sign says, a spirit-filled Baptist church. And I've talked to the pastor there. Are you guys charismatic? No, we're not charismatic, but we're spirit-filled. Do you want to argue with me about it? No. (laughs) And he's actually said, I'd like to take the sign down, but woe to the pastor who takes spirit-filled off the sign, you know? <laughs> of course you're spirit-filled. Not in the charismatic sense, in the sense that the Holy Spirit has indwelled you and gives you confidence to approach God. And that's why we're confident ministers, is the Spirit who dwells in and us. That's what is the difference between an Old Testament priest and a New Testament believer is. You know, priests were butchers and they didn't have the confidence to approach God. The new covenant minister, you don't tell people what to do to obey God, you direct them to Christ. You tell people to love, but not how to love. And that's one of the reasons I cringe when people say, you need more application in your sermons. That's, that's kind of old covenant-y for me. You need applications? Yeah. Love Jesus. <laughs> that's your application. 
Read the Bible more. Tell other people about them. I mean, the applications don't get much more specific than that. I don't tell you how to love. I just tell you to love. That's what it means that we're dealing with people's hearts here, with people's hearts. This doesn't mean that as a new covenant believer, you have no law in your life. Of course, the law in the old covenant came from God's character. You're still under God's character, but now you're in God's character more than under it. You're in Christ. Do you understand that? The Holy Spirit has brought you, and this is why you need to understand the Trinity, the Father to the Son, the Spirit, the affection between them. The Spirit brings you into Christ. And so now, you're not upholding a law. You're not achieving some external standard of a law. The Holy Spirit has brought you in, in a sense, into the Trinity itself. So now you're, you're under the law, in a sense, but because you're in Christ. And that's why you can obey the commands of the New Testament. Not that you can be sinless, but you have them written on your heart. If it was just in the pages of Ephesians, you couldn't do this. If I just read Ephesians 5 to you all day long and said, husbands love your wives, wives respect your husband, it would be powerless to change you. But earlier when we read that, you know what? Some of you are gonna leave tonight and you are gonna love your wives more. And some of you wives will leave tonight and you will respect your husbands more. And it's not because of any skill in me. It's not even just from reading it on the page. It's the work of the Holy Spirit who's using the written word to change you, to change you. God does this. It's God who makes you confident. Then he says this. The letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. There's a lot more I want to say on that. I know sometimes pastors say it when they've actually run out of things to say. (laughs) I have a lot more I want to say about the letter killing, but the Spirit giving life, but I'm going to save it for next week. Um, Next week, we can come back and look at this. I want to talk about what the covenant of works is versus the covenant of grace what it means to be killed by the working of the law, what it means to be saved by the Holy Spirit in Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we know that the law is spiritual because you wrote it, but we know the law condemns. Praise be to Christ who kept the law perfectly and now keeps us near himself. Praise be to the Holy Spirit who brings us to Christ so that we don't, we're not subject to punishment for being apart from the law because we're in Christ who achieved the law. We're buried in him. We died to our sins in Christ. Now we've raised to newness of life in Christ. This is all the work of your spirit, the spirit who is sent by, by Christ to teach us about himself, the spirit sent by the Father to show us the love that even he has for the Son, We're thankful that we're in Christ. This is a spiritual enterprise that we're doing here. These songs are spiritual. These prayers are spiritual. Our belief is spiritual. Not because it's in the Bible, but because the Bible's in us. That's where we stand, Lord. We know we can't work our way to you. And you've worked your way to us. And now we're hidden in you. There's no point in boasting when all we have is from the Holy Spirit. There's no point in bragging when we're all in Christ. What we bring in Christ is our sin, of course, but the Holy Spirit convicts us even of that. So we're thankful for the indwelling of the Spirit, the convicting work of the Spirit, the supernatural faith to believe the gospel. We're grateful for the Spirit's presence in our hearts tonight. We give you thanks for him in Jesus' name. Amen. You have been listening to Emmanuel with Pastor Jesse Johnson. You can find more resources like this at ibcva.com. Here is a parting word from Pastor Jesse. If you have any questions about what you heard today, or if you want to learn more about what it means to follow Christ, please visit our church website, ibcva.com. If you're not a member of a local church and you live in the Washington, D.C. area, we'd love to have you worship with us here at Emmanuel. We're located in Northern Virginia, and for more information about when and where we worship, check out our church website. I hope to personally meet you this Sunday after our service. But no matter where you live, it's our hope that everyone who uses this resource is involved in their own local church. Now may God bless you this week as you seek Jesus constantly, serve the Lord faithfully, and share the gospel boldly.